Rollo, the chocolate treat with caramel inside. Rollo, Rollo, roll your boat gently in my mouth. <clears throat> Pop, top, check it out. Lick the foil with, with your, your tongue. tongue. Give, Give it to, to your, your friends, friends as a gift. As a gift. Let's change gears. Rollo, Tony, Brown Town. Check yourself at the door. Give me some more. Give me some more. Give me some more of your Rollos. That's pretty good. TBTN. This is my jam right here. Yeah, most people think I'm on drugs because I'm always happy. <laughs> Are you on drugs? No, I'm not. I'm high on life. We may have created a monster in the lab. It's not a monster. It's a cyborg that can kill without remorse. And there's just nothing wrong with listening ever. So listen if you know what's good for you. Remember, to achieve success, you must first conceive it and believe in it. Remember, impossible <laughs> is nothing. All right, hello, good morning, and welcome everyone to a Wednesday edition of TBTL, the show that just might be too beautiful to live. We are living in the midst of a podcast boom. My name is Luke Burbank. I am your host. Oh my God, he admitted it. Coming to you from the Westchester neighborhood of Los Angeles, California. California got sunshine. I'm just... Uh, uh, I usually say I'm I'm perched high above the mighty Columbia when I'm at the Madrona Hill studio. Here I am hunched, hunched right at the foot of Los Angeles International Airport where there are all kinds of enormous jetliners, big old jet airliners taking off, or as I thought the song went, big old Jed and the lineup. There are big old Jeds and the lineups taking off from LAX and cruising out over the Pacific Ocean and then uh, U-turning and heading off to wherever it is that they are heading. Here's where we're heading together, my friends. Episode 4,191 in a collector series. Let the fun begin. Speaking of airplanes, I was on one last night flying down here and I was seated next to a guy named Bert. And as Bert and I chopped it up, which I'll be honest with you, I wasn't 100% stoked about at the beginning of things. Just looking forward to doing some research for my CBS story I'm down here to do and also getting ready for Live Wire Friday night at the Prax in Corvallis. And by all that, I mean, let's be honest, watching TikTok on my phone. I was looking forward to that session. And uh, then Bert started chatting with me. And it turns out, Bert. Now that's interesting. One of the more interesting people I've ever been sat next to on an airplane, so we'll talk about uh, that. Oh, and we have a special announcement about Friday's episode. This is special. This is special. We're going to do something novel for us on Friday uh, involving us and another podcast because we are living in the midst of a podcast boom, as I've already indicated. Uh, so we'll do all of that with the help of this guy, longest-running Cobro of the show, maybe best known for his depictions of the tall ships. Uh, he is the top... Akron groomsman and head bottle washer. Believe it or not, I'm a complete cat. He's Andrew Walsh, and he's joining me right now. Good morning, my friend. Good morning. I love the name Bert. Let's get that out of the way, right? I named a neighborhood cat Bert one time. This Bert was living up to the hype. Yes. By the way. True like, Bert. I can't imagine meeting a Bert who actually was just kind of like meh. Right, like you just never, you just never meet a Bert who's just kind of phoning it in in life. The Berts right. are really bringing it. Yes, absolutely. Do you, can we jump right in? I'd like to hear how he's bringing it. Oh, would you like to learn about the Berts and the Bees? <laughs> you had Sorry, that I loaded. Wanted to, oh. I wanted to handle the show title early. <laughs> when did you think of that? How uh, early? When this I was morning? saying the word Berts and the Bees. <laughs> it's also like a lip balm kind of Berts sure, beeswax. So sure, I was yeah. kind of I got some help on that. I'm going to be honest with you. Yeah, so um, I got on the uh, airplane last night. A couple of things. One, I had to fly to Burbank, which is not usually my desired route, just because uh, where I'm staying is on the west side of Los Angeles, down in Westchester. So it's like 45 minutes from Burbank Airport, which is up in the San Fernando Valley. Um, and But there just weren't any flights to LAX that worked with my schedule. And when I, fl I will be honest with you, Andrew, when I fly to the Burbank Airport... I feel like I should get some kind of special treatment. I should at least get a, like a, huh, interesting. Your name is the name of the airport we're flying to. That's unusual. Yeah. Like, 
if I'm being totally honest, some part of me thinks there should it should be noted. We well, should have and a brick at least. That's all I ask. I just you know what I want? I want a designated stool at the Guy Fieri <laughs> Burbank Flavor Blast restaurant, yes. Flavor Town restaurant. I, he they, he is, I think, the chief restaurateur of the Burbank Airport. There are lots of signs about Guy Fieri's bar in the Burbank Airport. Um, I like so I'm checking my bag in, and the uh, the person at the at the bag check at um at at Portland International Airport says, "Where are you flying?" Burbank, and then she says, "Can I see your ID?" And I hand her my ID, and I'm just waiting for it. <laughs> I'm waiting for it. Her to say, "Well, well, well, well hold on." Mr. Sacramento, you're flying to Sacramento? <laughs> nothing. Absolutely nothing. And I just thought, do you see this a lot? Do you d- did you just put a Rick Vegas on a flight to Vegas? Did you just put a Tammy Chicago on a flight to <laughs> Chicago? Like nothing, no comment. Okay, so I get my I check my bag. I go Imagine if your and- name was Bob Hope though and you don't get <laughs> noted in the Bob Hope airport. That would really be something. They have done that by the way and I don't I don't love that. I feel like they've stolen the valor of what used to just be called Burbank. Now I believe it is it's like Bob Hope Hollywood mm-hmm. Burbank Airport. It's a real Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim situation <laughs> yes, up it there. Is. They're slowly moving. They're, the Burbank erasure is real, um, and they don't I, because I think what they're what they're well, like so many things on the periphery of Los Angeles. They've realized that if you if you call it anything other than Los Angeles or Hollywood, people are going to go, "Where is that?" So you don't want to call it the Burbank Airport because nobody knows what that means. You call it the like the downtown Los Angeles Airport, Disney, Mickey's <laughs> Adventure. Bob Hope Zendaya Airport. <laughs> Great SEO on that. <laughs> yeah, right. So I, I, I've every time I fly into that airport, I note how far back, how far below the fold the name Burbank is moving. But then I get on the flight, and I was fortunate enough to have been moved up towards the the front of the plane, and I did have a lot of work to do on a relatively short flight. It's like a couple of hours. I needed to read in on the story that I'm working on today for CBS. And again, we've got a book to read, to finish reading for Friday, uh, for Friday night show in Corvallis. And uh, I'm seated and I'm kind of getting my little scene set up. And then this guy plops down next to me and he just kind of goes, oh, made it. And I'm just like, is this the beginning of a conversation? <laughs> it, something as little as made it. <laughs> indicates okay we're and i by the way i had my little airpods in and i really the 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 general posture that i try to strike uh, on the airplane as it relates to my seatmates is um i want to be open and i want to be kind and i want to be the kind of person who looks like if you need to ask me a question or if you want to talk about something i'm here for it (laughs) but also i am totally fine with us not talking i'm trying to transmit all of that like uh, without, without saying it. And because I don't, I don't like it when someone seems huffy on the airplane, when someone seems really put off, Mm -hmm. um, that you would even like look at them when you sit down. I don't want, I don't want to be that seatmate. Um, but I also don't want to invite a conversation. And I thought, well, this is a, you know, this is, this is happening. So the, the, I kind of said, uh huh. Yeah. Like you made it. Okay. And then I'm like going back to my you know, little projects and stuff. I'm setting up my laptop and everything because I do this thing where I will start working before the plane has pushed back um, because one, the Wi-Fi sometimes is better. You're still catching the Wi-Fi <laughs> from the airport. Okay, yeah. And um, because you never know, even though these airplanes purport to have Wi-Fi, a lot of times it doesn't work very well. And there are pretty much every work system that I have to use outside of TBTL involves dual authentication. Mm-hmm. So like if We're I want to log into that for us too, by the way, just so you know, I knew it. This is, I got to start coming to these Wednesday meetings <laughs> with you and John, this is some serious BS, but like, uh, you know, if I'm, if I have to log into certain parts of the CBS, like uh, system, I need to also be able to get a text message, which is oddly, maybe not oddly, but it's sometimes everything will work except the getting of the text message. Yeah, that makes sense. Like, like the internet stuff is fine. I just never get, the, and then I land and I have like 35, um, you know, text messages from the system because I kept hitting refresh, send me another one. So all that is to say, I got my laptop out, got my headphones in, Bert, 
next to me has said, made it. And I was like, okay, we'll see what happens here. And then he just goes, like, I don't know, maybe 30 seconds go by and he goes, yep, another milk run. (laughs) I didn't have that on the pool. (laughs) I was like, all right, so now I, I... I take the AirPod out. <laughs> you got to. I'm not going to, because I also don't like to like leave those things in and talk to someone because I feel like that's kind of a, not yeah. the most friendly move. Like, hey, I don't, like, I, I want to be like, I see you, you're a human. So I like, I take the AirPod out and I go, oh yeah? And he goes, yeah. We, uh, uh, he goes, yeah, we do this flight about 25 times a year. And I'm thinking we, I don't see anybody else. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I said, oh, uh, do you live in Portland or do you live in Los Angeles? And he goes, oh, both. Uh, we've, uh, we've got a place down in Encino and a place up here uh, in Portland. We've got grandkids. And so we, you know, we do this about 10 days up here and then we, we go down. And I'm still thinking, the we, huh? And as I'm talking to him, there's a woman, and we're in first class, Bert and I, and there's a woman who is walking back towards coach and Bert's, I forget exactly what he says to me, but he says something. And the woman just kind of like just casually without even really making much eye contact with us goes, he's not joking. And she just continues <laughs> back to coach. And I learned this is Bert's wife. Okay. So, okay. So he's in first class. She's not. Right. And now this is where he got me. And I don't know if he knew this is how this was going to work, but this now Milk Run, I don't know. I don't really care about live, having a place in Portland and L.A. Okay, it happens. But the dynamic of you're in first class and your partner is in coach. Now, now, in the words of this drop. Now, that's interesting. I want to know how that played out and how that was, quote, unquote, okay. Because what I can tell you is that in my relationship with Becca, if I were to be in first class and she were to be in coach. Now, this has happened before. Like, it's been presented to us as an option. If we're flying together but we're on different reservations, I will sometimes get upgraded. Um, she is a, a lovely, very low-maintenance person who's like, sit wherever you want. I don't really care. But I have a sense that that would be a little bit, um, I don't know, just not the not the best partner behavior in my mind. I think maybe I wouldn't love it if the roles were reversed. So I will... When that happens, I will give up the seat in first class and come sit in coach and have a perfectly lovely time. This is what I say to Bert. I say something to the effect of, how did that happen that you're in first and your wife is in coach and how is that considered okay? And he goes, she makes a very, very good living. She insists on buying her own ticket and um, she doesn't want to pay for first class. She lo- she's just fine in coach, but I really feel like I need to be up here because I like to be able to spread out. And I said, oh, okay. And now, again, I don't want to get into counting people's money or finances, but that's an interesting financial arrangement, wouldn't you think? Maybe for a, for a couple where they're buying their own plane tickets and one of them wants to pay for first and the other doesn't want to pay for first? Yes, but not necessarily bad as I think about sure. it. I was thinking sure. about our dynamics as a, um, as a couple, Genevieve and I, yesterday, because I was looking for a new chair for my office. I've been using this. Like, Good. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, Andrew, I beg you. I beg you to get a new chair. So I um, so I ran to this, uh, what do you call it, like a, a resale shop um, when you, uh-huh. consignment shop is the word I'm looking for, uh, in Greenwood. I'm sure you know it. And I was like, maybe they have kind of a, a spiffy looking office chair that actually, you know, spins and pivots and does all the mm-hmm. things a modern chair <laughs> should do. And I go in there and... Um, they didn't have exactly what I was looking for, but for the low, low price of what I thought was forty-five, then thirty, then twenty-four ninety-nine, I ended up getting some—I don't know—this. It's some plasticky retro chair um, that is way more comfortable than what I was using. This is oh. not my style at all, but it'll get me through the next few weeks while I go, you know, shopping for the real for my forever chair. Um, but my point <laughs> with all of this is, I'm sitting there thinking, like, it's thirty dollars. Like, it's you know, I. If I rented this chair for thirty dollars, that's for three, three bananas, weeks. Michael. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That you get, you know, that I donated back or whatever. Like, I don't want to like, just go to the landfill and just like constantly be bringing chairs in and out of my home like an irresponsible chair owner. But um, anyway, my point is, I went through this little calculation. Like, well, would Genevieve do that? You know, like, cause, and I realized that 
in a good way, Genevieve is so much more conscious uh, about or conscientious maybe of, of maintaining our finances that she's rubbed off on me when I am like probably way more questioning whether I should drop 30 bucks on a temp chair um, yes. where in the past I probably wouldn't have thought so much about it. But I was thinking about it. I'm like, but that's not a bad thing. Mm -mm. It, um, and so in this dynamic, sorry, I'm pretty far away from your original point, but like I could see a dynamic where these two are fine financially, but they just have different sort of they have different lines for what something is worth. You know what I mean? And hers is like, eh, I don't want to spend our money on that. It's no big deal for me. I have short legs. You know what I mean? And so she just wants to save. And I think that's exactly what was going on. And I'm with you. Like, I think that totally is it. That's probably part of why their marriage is healthy is because they there's the, the freedom for both of them to kind of act in a way that feels true to them. And it doesn't mean anything about like, oh, are we close or not? Now, the thing was interesting was he was like, she makes a very good living and she buys her own tickets and she, um, you know, uh, she she doesn't like to spend the money on a first class ticket. And and I said, oh, is it a second marriage? And he goes, yeah. And I go, how long have you been married? He goes, 45 years. Nice. <laughs> 45 years is the second marriage. Yeah. Why, Andrew? Because Bert, as he would later explain to me, is 89 years old and a super ager. He ages superbly well. He does. He is part of a group of people who have actually been identified by scientists and medical specialists, and they don't know why this happens, but people who have almost zero cognitive decline as they get to the age that many other people begin or have fully been subsumed by just everything slowing down. Bert is not suffering from the ravages of time the way the rest of us are. He used to be the head of cardiology for UCLA. I asked him when he retired from cardiology. He said 48 years ago. <laughs> You think I'm joking with you right now. He he built the cardiology like department essentially at UCLA. And uh, this was, I think, during the Ford administration. <laughs> I asked him if he was there for the John Wooden stuff at UCLA. He said all of it. <laughs> He casually mentioned that he saved Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's mom's life. <laughs> Do you want to slow down on that one for a second? Yes. This was back when Kareem's name was Lou Alcinder. He was playing for John Wooden and the UCLA Bruins. His mother had come out to watch a game, and as she was getting on the airplane or was on the airplane flying home, she had an embolism. They had to return the flight to L.A. where Bert comes in, saves Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's mom's life. Did that mean Kareem was nice to him for the next 40 years? No. Does it return the He calls? said Kareem was a very angry person up until about 10 years ago. I said, have you checked in with him recently? He said, yes. How's he doing? He's doing fine. Like... I was somehow the topic of Wolfgang Puck came up. He goes, Wolfie? <laughs> I mean, it was, I, he's like, oh yeah, Spago, forget it. Like he goes, you know, the food there, he goes, unless you, and he starts mentioning, I want to be clear too, by the way, sometimes you meet up or you, you happen upon someone and they're name dropping in a way that feels gratuitous. It feels like they're trying to impress you. Like they're trying to make you think that they're somebody important. Then you meet someone who's just been alive for 90 years. Yeah. <laughs> and in those 90 years, he's been like sitting in row two of the forum during the Showtime Lakers yeah, right. and can tell you literally everything about every player because he met them because he was also a doctor. And if there was a medical emergency, he might have to come down on the court and like help somebody out with something like he's just been in Los Angeles and doing this kind of high profile work at for so long, or at least he was that he just ex has experienced so much stuff. And I mean, this wasn't the half of it. He grew up in the Bronx. Um, it didn't have a, a really a strong parent structure. His parents had basically died um, in, in, in Europe in the thirties. He's growing up in the Bronx. He's very poor. He uh, goes to, he somehow managed to get into uh, New York University. Um, and then he ends up at the uh, University of Chicago doing med school. 
And then he comes out to UCLA and uh, he's starting at UCLA, but he said he didn't have the gas money to drive back and forth between L.A. and Chicago. So he called up the army and enlisted. <laughs> this is, Luke, he was a doctor did, did, already. Did you did you invest in this guy's anti-aging cream? Let's get to the part um, of the story where Andrew, you're opening up your checkbook because uh, that's the only way this all makes sense. Andrew, do you understand that he did invent a sterilizing cream that does... <laughs> That deploys ster- sterility, that sterilizes a wound for seven continuous days. And this is, it's called Omnicide. And this is the breakthrough with Omnicide. There's this particular thing that is a sterilizing agent that they can put on a wound and it sterilizes it. But the problem is once it evaporates, then the sterilizing properties have evaporated. He invented the delivery device. This is why he retired from cardiology, because he was busy inventing this thing that applies it, it basically you put it on a wound and it sterilizes it for seven days because it continually releases this sterilization thing i was googling all of this as he was saying it andrew because i was uh-huh. like either this is the world's greatest flim flam artist or i have met one of the more interesting people who's who's walked upon planet earth in the last 90 years you're gonna think i'm joking and i'm not when i really thought the interesting part was going to be milk run <laughs> what does milk run? Is that is that a phrase? My dad says that. I thought this story was beginning with him literally traveling for a milk convention. <laughs> or I thought, I did not know that was a phrase. And I thought the joke was when he said another milk run, you were only casually interested in that. I'm like, that's very interesting to me. Like, what are you doing with milk? No, that was just the opening salvo. But what's weird is Walt B also says milk run. And that just means like just another just another getting here to there. This is my usual commute. Yeah, I think that's what it means, because the way my dad uses it is to say when my mom and dad are kind of coming down from where they live in Mm. Silverdale, as you well know down towards like they'll maybe stop off at my place they'll go to my sister liz's they'll go to my sister sarah's or you know they'll kind of do this circuit my dad will go yeah we're we're doing another milk run huh so there's i mean and he believe me bert's got bert's got like a lifetime on my dad so i don't know like how this that particular little phrase has is is both big with the uh practically 90 year old set and also the uh 70 year old set but it is how do you feel he clearly if he sits down and you know utters like two like phrases to himself 30 seconds apart or whatever it was he is indicating that he wants to talk right yet he's got the he's got this fascinating life you'd think that in the, part of him would be sick of telling these greatest hits over and over again like what do you think he would have done if you had not interacted with him would he have kept sort of pushing it uh, that's a that's a hard question to answer because that's a sort of counterfactual yeah you know that's the Bert in the high castle <laughs> and I don't I just don't know what would have happened yeah. because I didn't I think he would have let me put it this way I I don't think he would have pushed it unduly um I think I think he would have I don't think you get you you've sort of lived this long and you've been in this many rooms without being able to sort of read a room. Mm -hmm. Um, And so he didn't seem oblivious at all. He didn't seem like he was, and and like, this is one of the things about the the life that this guy seems to have lived is he was telling me all this stuff. And then eventually I got kind of invested. So then I'm asking questions and everything. Um, But I also don't think he like was desperate to have a conversation or tell me anything. I think Mm -hmm. he's just from a generation where they're less, worried about the implications of having making small talk for an hour and a half. Like in my generation, that's, you know, right up there with like, uh, you know, like public speaking or something in terms of number one fears that people my age suffer from. It's like the fears are public speaking, falling into an alligator pond and then having to talk to someone on the airplane. Those because why? Because I wanted to look at TikTok, Andrew. You know what Bert was uninterested in? TikTok. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, he did have an iPhone. At some point I said to him, I go, because I actually think about this in in my life, Andrew, and in your life, in, in our generation, I think that we have this interesting, we occupy this interesting little part of, of, of human history where we remember no internet, and but now we very much use the internet. So there's obviously digital natives, there's people like Addy doesn't really, my daughter doesn't really have a, a memory of 
of a time when the internet wasn't everywhere. Um, and, 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 but I do, but I also use the internet all the time. Like he's, he was doing some of the first, um, like, like angioplasties. Like there was things involving cardiology that didn't exist before. Uh, and not that he invented the Jarvik heart or something, but like he was doing practicing medicine at a time when like, we didn't really know what to do about the human heart. Mm -hmm. And in his lifetime and career, we figured out a lot about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like it's kind of insane. The things that this dude, um, the, the experience he's had and what he's watched change in the world. And the fact that right now he's still completely here with us. Um, he, uh, again, I want to be clear. Everybody's body is different. I don't want to set up mobility as the like some sort of a like a, a thing that indicates that you're living a good life or whatever. That being said, dude just walked right off the airplane. It was one of those. It's Burbank, so you don't go on a you know a, what do they call it a jetway. You do like you're like the Beatles yeah. landing in the in America. You go down the I love ramp. That. Yep. He's just going down the ramp, just walking along. Uh, they know there was a series of. Of, of wheelchairs that were ready to go for other passengers that needed some assistance, just kind of breezed right by them. We're waiting for the bags, and which took a while, and I'm getting the luggage. And I look over, and I had found a place to sit because I was like, I've been standing for over eight minutes. <laughs> I can't be dealing with this. And I look over, and Bert's just standing there waiting for his bag. Like, it was just, the whole thing was just remarkable. I mean, I haven't even gotten into his time in Germany. Like, it's the, the the guy has the in guy an has East German prison. I wouldn't put it past him at all. Um, he I mean, he was just a he was an utterly fascinating dude. And, you know, it was I mean, let me just if you want to know, you want Bert in a nutshell, Andrew. The flight attendant comes over and says, and, and I was low key hoping she would say, uh, Mr. Burbank, can I get you anything? And then I could have had the conversation about my name. Never came up. <laughs> I was that was my flex with bell. Bert. Just keep ringing the bell. Bert, yes. Bert is like, you know, yeah. And that's when I uh, took out that entire command post of Jerry's during World War II and then did field surgery. And I'm like, yeah, but my name is the same last name as the <laughs> airport we're going to. And nobody's even called it out yet. And it's getting uncommented upon. <laughs> Sir, <laughs> but uh, uh, I forget where I was. But anyway, uh, it, yeah, he it just the the guy, um, the guy lived a very very fascinating life. And I guess I guess my one of the takeaways from it is for me is I'm very glad that oh here was the thing I was gonna say. This is Bert in a nutshell. This is when I knew I was gonna like this guy. The flight attendant came over and said, "What would you like to drink?" And he goes, "A Hennessy XO," but you don't have those, so I'll take a Diet Coke. <laughs> Because I was like, huh, is this guy, this guy is pushing 90. Is he also going to be downing <laughs> brown liquor on this flight? Because this is rocking my world. He did, Andrew, I will tell you this, absolutely house a cheeseburger mm. from the flight. Like, they were like, we have a miso salad and we have a cheeseburger. I was like, I'll take the miso salad. And he was like, cheeseburger. And then he just, humph, just chomped it down. The cardiologist, the retired cardiologist just chomped down this cheeseburger. And I was like, I may need to really rethink everything I've been taught about about the human body. I don't want to ask this question because it's an obvious question, but I have to represent the audience here and ask it. Did you do the Nixon when you were coming down the stairs onto the tarmac? I had a qu I didn't because I'm going to now I'm going to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. You advocate for the audience. I advocate for myself <laughs> and my experience, my lived experience, Andrew. I did have this moment. First of all, I knew I was going to tell you about Bert about halfway through the flight. And I had already kind of, and, 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 you know, I really enjoyed, I got his phone number by the way. Nice. Um, so we're going to keep corresponding. But as we were going down that, you know, you don't, you don't, when you're 47 years old as I am, you're not yet noting, at least if you're me in my body, you're not yet noting like what is the um uh, what's what's the decline of this ramp right mm -hmm. you're not, i'm not looking at w what's a, what's a tripping hazard what is it like and, and now i'm i'm standing right behind bert and bert did say as he got out of his chair he goes the old guy moves slow hmm. he like let everyone in first class know that like you know he's going to like he's going to take his time and so and he was walking like uh, slower than I would walk uh, on a typical day, but but faster than I'm going to be walking at 89, okay? And he's making his way down the ramp, and I'm starting to now, I go from, 
like being kind of like, that's amazing. I just met this very interesting person to being like, please do not fall on this ramp because his whole story is going to change. Now, I don't know why I thought that was going to happen. He got there fine. He's living as this person has been managing their own life for like 89 years or something like it's going to be OK. But I did not do the Nixon because I got almost overwhelmed with this fear. And I started thinking, what am I going to do if he falls? How do I? He wasn't doing anything that made me think he was going to fall other than the fact that he's 89 years old and he's walking down a ramp that like, honestly, I wouldn't put Biden or Trump on. Yeah, right. Right. You know, I would put Trump on it. I'd actually put Trump on it and I would invert it and I would <laughs> I'd grease it up with snot. But anyway, hmm. like uh, I which is be a very time consuming way to lubricate that <laughs> ramp. But do we have a Michael Barbaro reaction to that sentence? I don't, I don't know that there is one. Yeah. Wow. Oh. Hmm. How about this? Mm. <laughs> That's the closest. How about uh? uh so explain that. <laughs> well, so first you get some cayenne pepper. <laughs> you put it, put it right in your nose. <laughs> you get a lot. Anyway, no, all that is to say I didn't Nixon off the plane, but I do very much enjoy that experience. It's so hard because not to think of it. it. Because you know what else it almost always coincides with in my experience and that's not completely true because they do this in Seattle a lot, um, depending on if you're on these small little, you know, puddle jumpers, as they call them. But my experience is primarily when you're getting off the plane in that way, you're in a warm climate. Oh, like, yeah. Because it's, you know, it's like you're in Palm Springs, you're in Hawaii, maybe. You're like, I love the feeling, I mean, who doesn't, but of getting off the airplane Maybe you're going on vacation. Maybe you're like in Beck and I went to Santa Barbara uh, a year or two ago. Same thing. You do you de you Nixon off the plane. Yeah. And like when you like step off that plane, and it's just like warm outside mm -hmm. and you're walking and you're on the tarmac and you're going to a tiny airport where, you know, the hassle level should be relatively low. Like it just feels the whole experience is very mm -hmm. positive for me generally. Or if you're me, you're involved in some sort of major international drug sale. That's there's the also that I do that. Yeah. Yeah. So that was uh, that was Bert. And um, and like I said, I got his number. We're going to stay in touch. He actually gave me some uh, like I don't want to say medical advice. And I also want to be careful because I don't want to I don't want to violate any HIPAA stuff. But he this wasn't for me. But but there's there's somebody in, in the expanded universe of my life who's been going through some medical stuff. And it um, it coincided with a particular area of expertise that Bert had, not cardiology, but something else. And I literally, he literally gave me the phone number of somebody to have them call and say, Bert sent you. That's this is a real that's thing. That's the phone center. That's the phone center where they start getting <laughs> you to. Invest. That's the time I, I, was share? Waiting, I knew it was. I knew it was out there somewhere. I know that would be. Oh my god! Honestly, I would just at that point. I would just. I would be like uh, tip of the cap for this was <laughs> well expertly worth it. played. Yeah. I love it. You call them up to say, like get some medical advice or see if they can make a call and kind of refer you to somebody, a specialist. And it's just Worldmark uh -huh. Timeshare Corporation, <laughs> which my right. parents are members of. Did I tell you uh, there was a um, an, an episode of The Daily a couple weeks ago about – um, uh, it was a really unfortunate story, actually, about a retired couple who in uh, I believe they were in I forget where they were in the U.S., but basically they owned some stake in a timeshare in like Tahoe. And the guy the, the, the guy got a call, somebody asking, hey, do you want to sell your timeshare? And he thought, yeah, actually, I do, because we don't use it very much anymore. And it ended up becoming the case that they, you know, not only did he not end up selling the timeshare, he somehow got sort of tricked into giving away like $900,000. It was a thing where they said like, here, sell us your timeshare. And, uh, oh, but you know what? We, we're, we're buying this. It's a Mexican company and we need like $2,000 is like the processing fee, but it'll be refunded to you after escrow, et cetera. And it's like the classic story. It's like, oh, okay. So then it's the $2,000 and it's like, oh, hey, we just hit another speed bump. We need 800 more dollars to get your 2,000. Like, And then once you're like in this kind of like free fall yeah. of – it's always more money to get your initial money back that you're owed. And it just can get really out of control for people. And it was a pretty sad story because they get this family, this, you know, got really cleaned out. And I immediately started worrying about my parents, which, by the way, is another thing <laughs> that I guess happens at our age, maybe, mm -hmm. is like you start thinking. And my parents are, fortunately, my parents are, are 
very healthy and, 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 and I mean, they're, here's what I'll say about my parents. They're as with it as they've ever been, which is to say somewhat with it. <laughs> is that what they mean by faint praise? Is that what the- I believe that's, you look it up in the dictionary. <laughs> like my, my parents are uh, like, would I, you know, would I trust them with every decision of my life? Absolutely not. Would I have ever? No. Should I have as a baby? Probably not. Like, but there's been no decline. It's kind of been a constant four, mm-hmm. and uh, they're still there, so that's good. But anyway, I I got worried about them because they also are involved in like a timeshare, and they, you know, also I think you know if somebody called them and said, "Hey, we want to pay you over market value for this timeshare thing that you bought," I could just see I could see my mom being like Walter. That's amazing. Think about what, you know, what we could do with that money or we could, you know, you know, whatever. Like they love this timeshare thing. They go all the time, whatever. It's like, but they also are conflicted about it. They feel like it was maybe because they keep they always what happens is they get offered a free weekend at the whatever. And then they go and then they're like, we're not buying any more credits. And then next thing you know, my dad's like, we got 20,000 more credits. (laughs) So anyway, I like literally called my parents to be like, if somebody calls you trying to buy your timeshare, mm-hmm. do not sell it. My dad goes, I get 12 calls like that a week. <laughs> and I was like, you have not called them back. He's like, no, no, it's a scam. I was yeah. like, okay, all right, cool. Good, just good. checking, just but checking. Yeah, it's good to check in on, not just our, like the older people in our lives too. Like, honestly, I think of your story, you know, from, I don't was it a year ago already? I don't know where you like kind of like clicked on something in an email because you thought something was automatically renewed for way yeah, more money I than you were them. willing. And you actually literally called them and it's kind of I like, talked to a person. It's good to remind ourselves, especially, and listen, you and I are not, uh, you know, We're not exactly like being held up as the examples of the young generation ourselves anymore. And so compared to Bert, I'm a goddamn spring chicken. Well, don't compare yourself to vampires, clearly. But um, (laughs) anyway, yeah, I mean, just like as the world changes, as the, you know, various techniques and technologies or whatever change to prey upon the people who are older than us this stuff is all getting even more <laughs> complicated for us as well because we didn't grow up yeah. in it, you know? And so, yeah. yeah, it's not a bad idea to check on, check, like, I think of your story all the time. Like, oh, yeah, just that's my dual authentication right there is if I'm tempted to do something slightly dangerous, I'll then remember your story and I will not click. The new one that I'm pretty concerned about is the AI spoofing of someone's voice mm-hmm. and then sending it, you know, using it as a way of, of, of tricking a family member into thinking that somebody is in danger or, you know, Mm -hmm. and needs money because that one just seems like as, as much as I think that I would be able to suss out a scam, it's like, if I got a call from, you know, from Addie Mm -hmm. and it, and it sounded like her, I don't know. I mean, we, we talked about that story of that finance writer in New York who ended up giving away a shoebox with whatever $50,000 in it. And I know that wasn't a voice spoofing, but it's like something happens in our kind of fight or flight. There's something primal that goes on or, or that's, you know what I mean? That's like very, very uh, like prehistoric in our, in our brains that shuts off logic because it feels like this could be the end of us. And that's obviously something that the scammers kind of know about. And I worry that like, so I, I actually like want to, I haven't done this yet, but I want to propose a password, a code word within the family. Huh? That's just like, Hey, if somebody, if anybody in this family calls anybody and says, I'm in a Mexican prison, well, it's going to be me first of all. (laughs) And it's probably true. That's a, see, that's the problem for the people in my life with a scenario horrific enough. I've spent a lifetime in tight spots that are the exact kind of thing that the scammers are like, you know, your sainted grandmother who's never done anything wrong in her life is calling you from a Guatemalan jail. <laughs> like, what are the chances? Now, if it's me, like, <laughs> hey, I'm in I'm in the uh, Clark County Jail in Vegas right now, it'd be like, mm, that sort yep, of checks yeah. out. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm very seriously like, I'm at the next uh, Burbank Summit, the next get-together of the fam, I'm going to propose a, a code word, and I know what the code word is. What is it? Uh, uh, and I'm, um, it, I almost like, got you so close. I could feel it. It was right there. I, I want us to have a code word within the family that if, if anyone calls in, in a situation, you say, okay, okay, I want to help you just tell me the code word. 
And then ideally that would be, you know, an indicator of if it's because our family is so huge. There are so many people and there are so many like ancillary <laughs> and tributaries of our family now that it's like it, it just seems like the math is against us in terms of somebody getting scammed. And then and uh, that particular scam. I mean, again, the good news is my parents have no money. So they as long as they don't get scammed out of their timeshare, I think they're going to be OK. We was hoping for some razzle dazzle. Razzle dazzle. That's right, man. Razzle dazzle. On your mark. On your mark. Get set. Get set. Now ready. Ready. Go. Everybody razzle dazzle. Everybody All right, let's thank some dazzling donors. These folks are making it possible for TBTL to exist. I mean, for me to sing the song of Bert from seat 2C on the PDX to Burbank flight last night. It's only happening because of the financial support of people like Johnny and Karen Calcagno. If I had my bell, I would ring it, Andrew, because I promise you that is the first time I've ever said their names correctly. I let you down with the bell there. No, no, no. That's a, that's, that's okay. I I didn't give you the, I didn't give you the code word. (laughs) The code word is Calcagno. (laughs) Of course, also we've got Johnny and Riley. Yeah. Cal Cagno, friends of the show, particularly Riley and his music career. I just, um, I want to, as I feel like I've been doing a lot lately, I want to uh, say thank you and also apologize for just how I've been butchering the last name of this family for so many, many years. All right, Cal Cagno, note to self. The Cal Cagnos are in Seattle, Washington. And Johnny says, for this year's dazzling donor message, we want to highlight a few of the things that have kept us listening since the AM days. Oh, this is actually very good. Um, this will be, this is the secret sauce of TBTL. Don't, if you're listening to this, don't use this Mm. to form your own podcast and lure the Calcagnos away from us. Okay. This might be an opportunity for me to beep out this whole next part of the day. We've never done that before. That'd be exciting. Just redact the next (laughs) 1.5 minutes of the show, please. Because this is like the Colonel's 11 herbs and spices. Mm -hmm. If, the, if this gets out, you, other people could create a very niche mm-hmm. podcast and do it for up to 15 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, here are the things. The opening montages are so damn good, you could quit there after every episode. And believe me, Johnny, I've considered it. <laughs> that's all Andrew, my friends. That is Love all it. Andrew. Thank that's you. one of those That's one of those things that's that's a, a been an interesting evolution for the show, which is I loved the Don and Mike show out of WJFK in DC and they had this epically long intro that just had, I mean, theirs was like, I don't know, 11 or 12 minutes long. This music just playing and playing and playing. And then just these drops. And I just thought it was the coolest thing and always thought if I could ever get my own like commercial radio show, I wanted to do that. But then what I was actually doing, and I know what you're going to say here, Andrew, Mm. which is you kind of liked the real, let's just say rustic nature. (laughs) Whenever anything is, Whenever anything is not done very well now, we just call it rustic and we try to pass it off as a feature, not a bug. I love that as an audio term. I've never heard it applied that way, but I'm in love with it. <laughs> it's a real, I, 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 I roughly chopped the audio. <laughs> yes. um, I just, I, I don't listen back to those early uh, intro packages and feel very good about it. But then I like that you liked it enough that you came and worked on the show and then really perfected the perfected the format like just have made for now many many years these great great intro packages which i i I love johnny i'm sitting here listening along with you loving them myself oh yeah we had something this is going to sound like i'm like i'm passive aggressively um dragging you luke but we had something going on uh a couple of weeks ago where your mic was open we're using a different setup now and I can't mute you on my end. Mm -hmm. And so your mic was open and I didn't hear it while we were playing the opening tape, but later on I grab our recording and I can hear what I didn't hear because you were muted at the time and you're laughing along with the intro package. And it it made me feel very good. I had to cut it out, obviously. (laughs) But it was fun to hear you just like, I had no idea that you're over there like chuckling at what you heard in the intro. I love, I honestly really, really love the intros. It's a delight. Whether I've heard it before or not, I'm always delighted by those. So really good job. Um, 
Uh, let's see. Uh, Johnny says, you could quit there after every episode, though we're grateful that you don't. We're also continually gobsmacked by your ability to keep the stories and jokes going hour after hour and week after week. So much blather. <laughs> Some of it interesting. Okay, all right. Things okay, are getting a little be, heated. Watch yourself. I think <laughs> Riley wrote that. I don't know about that. Finally, we have to mention community. We walk every day to the original broadcast coffee location and enjoy supporting Barry... Our friend Broadcast Barry, an awesome human being and coffee roaster and an example of uh, the good peeps of TBTL. And boy, let me tell you, Johnny, Karen, and Calcagnos, yeah, Broadcast Barry is uh, just the absolute salt of the earth mm -hmm. and a dear friend of the show on so many levels. Yes. <laughs> like financially, from an advice standpoint, um, as a runner, as a power traveler. Like, uh, yeah, Barry is, is great, and I'm and glad to hear... And as a dinner companion. I'm having dinner with him next weekend. Mm. Hmm. I'm not. No. Well, Interesting. I mean, as a backstabber. As a schemer. Seattle, when you as a, schemer, Seattle, you get as a little the... finger. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, 2023 was a good year for us. In September, Riley released a new album with his partner, Viv, called Imaginary People. Nice. A title that reminds us of our favorite imaginary radio oh. show. It's truly a banger. Check it out on Bandcamp and all the streaming platforms. Viv and Riley tour constantly throughout the U.S. and have appeared on recent episodes of Mountain Stage and E-Town. Holy smokes, Mountain Stage. That's, That's great. I know. I, I, I was also blown away by that. I am realizing something here, though. Do a little production on the air as I want to do. I meant to save this for a Friday so that song could be, you know, um, imaginary people could be a music for your weekend. Can we remember this for the next music for your weekend? We need to make sure to give that a spin. I want to say that I completely support that as an idea. But I didn't. But I, I didn't think the chances of. No, 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 no. Uh -oh. <laughs> I'm saying the chances of. Of a, a week from this Friday, because we've got a special program yeah. on Friday, which we're yeah. going to tell you about in a minute. The chances of me remembering that are they are uh, this is one of my favorite things. Now, I would say there's a non zero chance, mm -hmm. meaning there's at any chance at all. This is, in fact, a sub zero chance. Mm -hmm. There's a less than zero chance I'll remember that. So, if you can take a note, I would love, love for that to be a music for your weekend two Fridays from now. The way I'm going to remember this is I'm going to email myself a note. Nice. And unread emails in my inbox drive me bananas, so I'm always working to open them and then Perfect. blast them away, as my dad would say. So I'm sending me an email, and I'm copying you just as an extra little uh, lanyap there. Nice. Okay, good. Between you, me, and Bob Walsh, we may yes. be able to remember this for I'll next Friday. I'll copy dad, so. too. Good idea. <laughs> good. Uh, thank you, Cal Cagno family, for supporting TBTL for all these years. And uh, we really do appreciate you. Maestro? On your mark. On your mark. Get set. Get set. Now ready. Ready. Go. Everybody rattle, rattle. Look who it is. It's our friend Joe Michael Wright in Prescott, Arizona. I like that I said Prescott correctly, but I said Arizona in a really funny way. I was thinking it. Uh, Joe Michael Wright says, beginning this year, I'm dedicating my dazzling message to report back on old shows. All right. <laughs> uh, I started a re-listening project while at work. I run a canning line for a brewery and am currently through show number 60. Okay. Let's see here. I'm curious. I mean, I'm genuinely curious what it is that Joe Michael has been uncovering on these. Those are episodes that I will never, ever, ever go back and listen to. Um, see previous comments about the audio quality and also just my hosting. We don't have to go down that road. It's fine. It is what it is. Uh, so far, we've met Nikki with two Ks. Oh, yeah. Nikki with two Ks, our old friend. Um, uh, who uh, I forget how, I think Nikki was just a listener mm -hmm. um, who must have emailed in or called in, but then became a vital part of the show for many years. She was part of the Battle of Beast Lake, where I think she had a push up contest oh, with right, Sean DeTori. Right, right. Where Sean did way better than I expected. I mean, he still got his ass kicked by Nikki. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't even close. But it was he actually did did way better than I would have and better than I expected him to. Um, I ran a marathon with her. She and yeah. John DiLoretto and I. That was until uh, Nikki with two Ks. I think she did the first like twenty miles with us just to be nice. And then at some point was like, Hey, I might just kind of um. I might just scamper up ahead a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then she just like turned on the afterburners and then just turned into a cartoon puff of <laughs> I dust. I was literally going to say that. Exactly. I was picturing it Looney Tunes style. 
And I was like, oh, you were just being nice for the last 20 miles, weren't you? <laughs> you? And then I think she, you know, did the last 6.2 miles, it like, you know, four minute miles or something. Um, anyway, uh, a, an amazing person, an amazing athlete, our friend Nikki with two Ks. Uh, also, uh, I've heard the amazing five layer Madonna mashup with Jen singing Borderline. Oh, wow. I don't remember that, but I don't like anything about that description. Why did you guys get fired? <laughs> Uh, we've also, in these first 60 episodes, found Jason's childhood choir oh, teacher. Nice. Now, that was a cute one. That one's the cute one. <laughs> um, that was, uh, yeah, Jason, uh, Jen's husband, Jason Andrews, uh, had a choir teacher that he really, really appreciated and made a real impression on him. And we were able to, as mystery solvers, uh, track her down and I think reunite them. And if I remember right, it was a really, really kind of sweet moment on the show. Nice. Uh, let's see. Uh, Wednesdays with Busey. <laughs> guessing. I try, I'm trying to figure out if I remember that or it just sounds perfect for that era of TVTL. I think, yeah. Uh, Luke won the over 70s division of the St. Patrick's Day Dash. That's a true story. They entered, and that's in fact how I ended up running that marathon. They entered me, somebody at the radio station inputted me with the wrong birth date. Like they were signing us up to do the St. Patrick's Day Dash as quote unquote celebrities like does anyone want to run the St. Patty's Day dash on behalf of the station and I did and then of course I ended up winning it because uh, I was uh, in the wrong age group and then I we called the guy this was also probably not even legal but we just cold called the dude who should have won and he picked up the phone and we just started talking to him on the air <laughs> and that was John DiLoretto and, and in, in that conversation he said well would you like to run a marathon with me and that was how the eagle soaring exactly. started on the program. Yeah. That was the story on that. Uh, been introduced to Ma, Pa, It's Just Beautiful by the TBTL players. Man, that is, that's some real canon here on the show, right? Yeah. Now, you've played that drop, Ma, Pa, It's Just Beautiful, uh, a million times on the show. one billion times. Probably the most played drop other than Let the Fun Begin. And then, I don't know how many years ago it was for one of our anniversaries or something. Oh, Ma. We Pa, it's just beautiful. We played like the whole, or at least I got to go back and listen to more of the context mm -hmm. of that, the, the whole yeah. skit that you guys were doing on the radio. I see that Joe Michael here says uh, Rachel Be Bell, parenthetically. It's not Rachel saying Ma no, Pa, it's right? No, Aaron okay. Covey. Okay. Aaron Covey was a, a reporter at Cairo, um, and we were doing some sort of the TBTL players, which was this little... Um, I, what would you call it? Dramatic reading group that we put together that featured me, Jen, Sean DeTore on both um, uh, acting and doing all the sound effects in real time. We did one that was Star Trek. Uh, we did a Little House on the Prairie and we were missing, I forget, some character from Little House. So we grabbed Aaron Covey and said, would you please come in and read these lines? And for some reason, her reading of this line kind of made me. Oh, ma. Pa, it's just beautiful. It made me laugh, and um, we grabbed it as audio, and all these years later, it almost every single day it gets played <laughs> on the show. And I, I think maybe what surprised me when I went back and listened to what Joe Michael is referring to here is Rachel was in some of those sketches as well, and maybe even that particular sure. sketch. But she, Yes, very possible. I, when I was reading this last night, I was like, oh my gosh, have I been hearing that over and over, and that's Rachel? But I didn't no. think so. Okay. You would know a Rachel Bell yeah. if you heard one, okay. You're, you know, being a, a current friend. Um Let's see. Also, uh, Luke bought a totem pole from the former Twin Teepees. Interesting. I that I, I remember us talking extensively about this restaurant that was on Aurora Avenue called Twin Teepees. Um, you know, nothing about it culturally is probably a good idea with the benefit of time. But it loomed very large in my imagination as a kid because, first of all, they were just... It was a very interesting design for a building. And also, it was where like my dad and the other guys from the church from gospel outreach who lived in the area would get together for like men's meetings sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so it, it just kind of loomed large in my mind. What I didn't realize at the time, thankfully, and, and what never sort of came to pass because it was gone, I think before I was 21 years old, it had a bar in it. And I have to imagine it was the best dive bar in Seattle just, I mean, it just from based on the era of the building, based on the people that lived in the area at the time, like if I would have been 30 and Twin Teepees was still open and had a bar, I feel like I would have lived there mm -hmm. potentially. Mm -hmm. 
because like one of the teepees, if my memory serves, was the dining area. And, you know, it was like a Denny's kind of a thing. And then the other one I feel like was the bar. Mm-hmm. And like, I mean, you know what I'm saying, Andrew. 1 p.m. on a sunny Friday. Yeah. Getting tight, as you would say, at the bar side of Twin Teepees. Doesn't sound like the worst Friday <laughs> afternoon of my life. You know, not to sideline us too much here, but um, I, I may have even texted you this. And I hope my friends don't hear this because I don't want to be a bummer. But a friend of ours pointed out to me that there's a Denny's in Shoreline that actually has a bar in it. Did you you must have known about this? Oh, right? sure. That those are your old stomping ground sort of. Um, but I was surprised by that. I've never heard of a, a combination, you know, like a, a, a you know, a Denny's that would sell uh, that would sell alcohol. Booze. I'm trying to think. Yeah. Sorry. I'm stumbling there. because I'm like, do they sell mimosas? No, I can't even picture that. So anyway, I was excited by the notion of it. And so we mm-hmm. went up there for my friend's birthday and we ate at the Denny's. And then you go into a different room where the bar is. And I got to say. I don't know if I'm aging out of a certain kind of dive bar or if it just didn't meld the way I wanted it to. And it was a little bit of a bummer. Have you been in that bar before? I haven't been in that one, but the Denny's in Ballard, speaking of things that were a big deal in the early days of TBTL, there was a Denny's in Ballard um, that was architecturally significant because it was what was called a googie architecture design. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we uh, launched a campaign to, it it was, you know, it was no longer a Denny's. Um, I think it was just an empty building that was going to become condos. It's where that like five guys is now. They're right at like kind of market Mm -hmm. and um, Ballard Avenue. I think it is, or maybe whatever, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I think so. And it it was, my memory is that the Denny's had been because of its architectural significance, it was historically preserved. And then there was some sort of paperwork issue where at like 6 p.m. on a certain date, it was not historically preserved until like, let's say, 6 a.m. the next morning, because that's when the new designation would kick in. There was a very brief window of time. And whoever owned the property seized upon that window of time to just demolish the thing literally under the cover of night. And it makes me so angry to even think about. But that Denny's had a bar. And we used to go to that bar sometimes, although that was an embarrassment of great dive bars because that was just spitting distance from Sunset Lanes Bowling Alley, which also had an incredible bar. That Sunset Lanes is now, I don't even know what condo is there, but like Mm -hmm. back in those days, just that area of Ballard had so, uh, so many fun places to go that were just like that. And so, yes, I have been to a Denny's bar, not the one in Shoreline. There is, I'll tell you... (laughs) There's one in Portland. There's a Denny's kind of over by where I used to live that I don't even know what was going on in my life that I was going to do this. But, you know, in Portland bars, they have um, like these video like like slot machines and it's it's all run through the Portland lottery. So you're you're playing what looks like a slot machine. But really what you're doing is buying a lottery ticket, Mm -hmm. like a lot of lottery tickets, like a ticket, a ticket. A ticket, <laughs> you know, it goes fast potentially. And I, I don't know if I just always been curious, but this Denny's, when you have those, they have this Oregon lottery sign on the building. And I was like, how is this Denny's have a, like a casino in it? Mm-hmm. And so I remember walking into this Denny's and going back towards the back area where like the bar was and where the slot machines were. But because this is a part of Portland that also has a lot of people that are really on the economic margins. Like, as I'm walking back towards a thing, a server comes out and, like, blocks my way and goes, I need to see your driver's license. (laughs) And I was like, oh, this is, by the way, that's something that's used a lot. I've noted it in Portland. It's used very frequently uh, in bars uh, and uh, mostly in bars where there are a lot of people also who are potentially, like, unhoused or kind of on the margins coming in. The way that servers and and people, and by the way, my heart goes out to the people working at these establishments too. That doesn't seem like an easy job, but one of the main ways that they sort of can regulate who's in there is asking, do you have your ID? I see. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Because a lot of people, a lot of people that are, that are again on the margins don't have like a kind of government issued ID. So Mm. that's a really quick way to just be like, you can't be in here. Um, And so sure enough, the person asked me, do you have an ID? And I was like, I do have an ID, but I'm feeling like this is just that was the sign from above that I don't need to be hanging out in this Denny's bar 
with the slot machines, if it's the kind of place where like you're IDing everyone so you can try to kick out the people that you think might be trouble. Yeah, that, see, it kind of took me a second there because I'm like, oh yeah, it's a bar. They ID, you know. Even I still get ID'd. I guess mostly at the yeah, you know. I, yeah, actually, I guess I get ID'd at the grocery store all the time. Maybe I, I can't remember the last time I got ID'd at a bar. I was at a actually a diner the other day. <laughs> somebody else said my internal thoughts, and I didn't like it coming out of somebody <laughs> else's mouth. You ever have one of those? We were at a, a diner. Yeah, it's called the other, TBTL. Yeah, <laughs> Beavis and I were having uh, breakfast. At, I don't want to sideline us because if I tell you or try to remember what it's called, uh, we'll go on for 45 minutes of you naming places in Lake City. But anyway, we're at this quirky little diner, and um, th- it was one of those places that's so small, any conversation you're having, you're also having with the wait staff or certainly like our yeah. our server. And um, we were t- I can't remember what we were talking about. It doesn't really matter. And but it, she casually mentioned, well, I guess I'm a little bit younger than you guys. And I got to say, like, I think that about people all the time, like, oh, yeah, I'm kind of getting up there. And a lot of the people I'm interacting with are a bit younger than me. But I didn't take it as a given that this woman <laughs> wasn't my age. And I was like, there's something I'm putting out there now that just kind of says, mm. like, you know, and then I was like, oh, yeah, she probably is significantly younger than me. Was it that you were having dinner at 4 p.m.? <laughs> It was called Supper at 4 p.m., <laughs> Luke. And the mashed potatoes were a little bit dry, but still pretty good. No, I don't know. Just hearing somebody else say, well, I guess you're a little bit older than me. I was like, wait, no, I can say that you're a little bit younger than me, but I don't think you're allowed to say that I'm older than you. Right. Yeah. Um, somebody called Becca ma'am the other day, <laughs> and it absolutely ruined her week. <laughs> and I was like, well, isn't that a sign of respect? And I was, you know, and she was like, you don't you don't understand what this does to me when that happens. I thought, Oh, I think maybe I was trying to like spin it. I was like, well, uh, it usually miss. And then after, at a certain point it's ma'am. And maybe we just don't say miss anymore. So like they would, and now she was like, no, 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 you don't, I go, I don't get mad if they call me, sir. And she goes, it's different. <laughs> You're like, I demand that people call me, sir. Exactly. Mr. Sir Burbank. <laughs> um, let's get back to Joe Michael Wright's uh, dazzling donor message. Uh, he says, it's been quite the rewrite already. Tune in uh, next year to see where we're at, unless I forget about this, which is possible. Either way, <laughs> thanks, guys, for all you do. Joe Thank Michael, you. I don't want to put pressure on you, but if you, I've already said I don't want to listen back to these episodes because it mortifies me, but if you would like to continue the project and next year update us, this is the exact right way for me to re-experience old episodes mm-hmm. of TBTL, is through the lens of Joe Michael just kind of telling me the broad strokes. That's your assignment, Dazzling Donor. <laughs> Donate the Dazzling Dough and do the research and report back, please. Thank, Thank you, you, Joe Michael. Here I go once again with the email. Every week, I hope that it's from a female. No, oh, man, it's not from a female. All right. Uh, we don't uh, actually have any emails or emails that are burning up our inbox. I mean, we have a lot of them. Yep. Don't get me wrong. We have oh, plenty. They're burning. they're burning. I just like the heat. They're, they're itching and burning. <laughs> uh, but no, what we really want to do, because we keep promoting it, is make our big announcement. Attention, everybody. Madams and Miss Waz. Uh, we want to announce that on Friday, this Friday, we are doing, I think, our first ever crossover episode <laughs> with... No, I said it that way. <laughs> you really? Wow. It's it's like motocross, only it's a crossover. That's exactly... <laughs> you know that's why I said that? Like, Because the word cross, I think, reminded me of motocross, yeah, which reminded yeah. me of like Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Um, we are doing a crossover episode with... The Text Me Back podcast, which is, of course, the show that our friends Lindy West and now our new friend Megan Hatcher Mays make. We've run promotion for it on this program. They've been promoting our show over there. But what we've never done is just straight up done an episode together, the four of us Mm -hmm. podcasting together, finally, like the four horse people of the apocalypse. (laughs) I'm pestilence. You always get to be pestilence. (laughs) (laughs) It was Um, so much fun to have them on the show. We recorded this a couple of days ago. I don't mind saying, Uh, but it was ridiculously fun. And, um, you know, even if you're not interested in conversation, if you just want to hear me just sort of snort laugh and cry laugh uh, throughout the show, this is the one for you. Yeah. Megan and Lindy 
have been doing the show, I'm going to say for maybe like a year or something. Mm -hmm. And um, it started off as a production with KUOW in Seattle, who we love. And now they've struck out on their own. They're independent. That's v the analogs with TBTL are so many. I mean, other than their show being incredibly catchy. Mm -hmm. um, although they do, let me just say this, Andrew. They do edit their show. And we don't edit this show. So I'm just saying, when you when you become an obsessed fan, I'm talking to the listeners now, of Text Me Back, which you mm -hmm. should because the show is so good, just realize that they are presenting the best version of themselves to you, <laughs> which is something we could do but choose not to. Okay? Yeah, that, oh, I just wow. want to level really set taking, here. This is taking a turn that I'm having trouble keeping up with, to be honest with you. I know, you. me too, actually. And I'm the one, <laughs> and I'm the one driving the bus. I apologize. Um, anyway, uh, Friday is going to be a great uh, show. We are, so this is why it's a crossover episode, because it's it's Friday's episode of TBTL, and it's also, I believe, Friday's episode of Text Me Back. Yeah. So you, the tens of listeners, will get, if you haven't yet experienced uh, that show, you'll get to hear kind of what it sounds like uh, with, with Lindy and Megan, and uh, the listeners of their show will get to hear what it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> when Bert Jr. and Andrew <laughs> pipe up on the microphone. So anyway, that is uh, that's going to be Friday's episode. And it really is so good. Like if I don't understand the economics of all of this, I feel like if this show could be and not just the economics of it, but the like logistics of it. If this if TBTL and Text Me Back could just be some kind of mega show. Uh, that was the, the four of us, it would be such, uh -huh. I feel like it would be such a good program. And, and we are going to try to do this more frequently because it was so much fun. So That's right. We, have, uh, we already have some special nicknames cooking for the oh, yes. four of us. We can't give it away here, but no, let's no, just no. say they're uh, very polished. I ain't polished. giving that milk away. <laughs> I ain't very... making that milk run. <laughs> they're very polished and ready to go. But you have to yes. tune in on Friday to hear that. Yes, so uh, definitely make sure. And also, um, go over to the Text Me Back. The thing, too, that's really fun, and this isn't a spoiler, is that the, the Text Me Back community is, is really kind of developing uh, or has developed in a way that reminds me a lot of the TBTL 10s community. Just talking to, to Lindy and Megan about, like, the fact that people are submitting songs and sending in, mm -hmm. you know, voicemails from their kids and making art and stuff. And I'm just like, oh, my gosh, this is so cool. Like, this is... What has made TBTL so much fun to get to be a part of all these years is uh, the people hearing us right now, you, the tens, and the Text Me Back folks are really kind of creating the same ecosystem and uh, or similar ecosystem, I should say. And it's just very, very, uh, very cool and fun. So if you like our show, you're going to uh, like their show and you're really going to like Friday's episode of TBTL. So yes. do join us for that. All right. That is going to wrap it up for today's program. But guess what? Tomorrow, special co-host Bert <laughs> will be here. It's interesting. So not guest. I, what I heard was co-host, which the you're going to be driving, races, Andrew. Um... Bert is going to be right. <laughs> listen, I've already I had a two hour download with Bert. Uh -huh. Okay. But now it's your turn to, to get in the. It's going to be 90 minutes of me saying, but milk run. What does that mean? <laughs> All right, thanks, everybody. We'll be back here tomorrow with more Imaginary Radio for you. In the meantime, have a great Wednesday. Take care of yourselves. And please remember, no mountain too tall. And good luck to all. How much milk do I have to drink to be big enough to be quarterback? Uh, drink as much milk as your little belly can hold. At all times, drink as much as your little belly can hold. Power out.